We have uh, on the phone with us someone I'm absolutely excited to interview and to talk to, someone that I have read extensively, Mr. Grant Cardone. Grant, are you with us? Yes, I am. How are you doing? Great. Grant, thank you so much for being with us today. It's a real honor to have you on the show. Hey, thank you so much for having me and thinking enough of me and my work and uh, what I've accomplished, a little bit of how I've accomplished. Well, you've done some amazing things. Can we start sort of at the beginning and jump back to your first mega hit book, the first book of yours that I read? Tell us about Sell to Survive, would you, and how that created your whole empire and your whole philosophy. Well, you know, when Lehman collapsed, I wrote that book the weekend after Lehman collapsed. And I had I had spent the last 30 years as an entrepreneur since I was 20, I guess, 25 years old, uh, one, learning how to become a salesperson and be proficient as a salesperson in an industry regardless of the economy. And then I started multiple businesses, a software company and a consulting company and uh, and also a real estate company. And so it spent the last 20 or 25 years up to Lehman Collapse building those companies. They were great companies. They were working. Even the real estate, even when the real estate thing collapsed, the real estate I was buying, which was apartment buildings, were still doing extremely well. And then the bottom fell out. And that weekend I wrote a, that book. And that book was basically telling the world, look, everything has changed. The economy will be different forever not for a short period of time, but forever. And regardless of your position or your title or what you think you do, you are now a salesperson. They will be the most protected group of people. Whether you work for an organization or you work for yourself, you have to go out and sell your products and your services. I was saying in that book that they'll be high on employment. The only way to get a job is to sell yourself. The only way to get a raise is to sell yourself. And that book was basically saying, hey, the whole world this weekend became a salesperson, and you got to learn this skill now. How do you think the economy changed with the collapse of Lehman and all of the consolidation that happened? And now that we have these banks that are literally too big to not only fail, but too big to prosecute, that they seem to have a license to do whatever they want. So what does the economy look like now for us small people? Well, for the little for little guys like us that are scrapping and, you know, out there punching and shoving and trying to grab our piece every day, look, this economy, when you have this much uncertainty, I'm not going to go into the bank thing with you, but when you have this much uncertainty, we've had uncertainty now for four or five years. This uncertainty will not go away because the moment things get better, everybody – Everybody, when you wake up in the morning, you have to confront that there's $17 trillion of debt that this country never had. That, that has exploded, and everybody with, with a, a, just a dash of intelligence, that has to be confronted. So that makes consumers and buyers of your products and services, or even if you're trying to get a job or a better job, it makes people uncertain. It makes them cautious. So that's what I mean. The economy is different because we've never had this level of uncertainty since maybe the Great Depression. And that means you have to be – you know, you see a lot of companies going out of business right now because they went to the lowest price, and that didn't provide – that didn't allow that company to work, and then they failed. Or you see people in the middle class right now falling off the edges into poverty – why? Because they don't make enough money. They don't save enough money. They have, there is no money for them to invest, and so they fall off the edges uh, when you see you, you, when you see market conditions like this. You know, you mentioned the lowest price strategy. I I love to tell the the I guess it's a joke about the Walmart award. I don't know what the award is, but for the supplier who lowers the price the most, they give them a big award at the end of the year, and if the Two years in a row, they lower the price. They give them even a bigger award. And if three years in a, lo- in a row they lower the price, they just go bankrupt. And so, yeah, yeah right. What That's are your <laughs> What are your thoughts, Grant, on pricing well, strategy and selling? And so, w- w- you you commented on lowest price. What are your thoughts on pricing models? Well, I can tell that you read the book because you know there's three chapters in there about leave the lowest price. Don't be that guy. Because it's a tightrope to walk. And people, you use the right example because people think, well, I'm going to be Walmarts. Walmarts isn't selling at the lowest price. They're buying from vendors at the lowest price and then not committed to that inventory. 
People don't understand this. When I sell my books to Walmarts, Walmarts has an out. If those books don't sell, I got to come take them back. That's right. So, so Walmarts basically has put themselves in a position that the dentist, the chiropractor, if you, you own a beauty salon or you own a services business the way I do, or you own real estate and you're renting apartments, you can't duplicate that model. So to think that you're going to be the lowest cost provider, I mean, ask yourself, are you already operating with margins that are so narrow that any inflation at all at the grocery store, actually you feel the pain of it? If you do, then the only thing to do is to go the other direction. And the other direction is don't be the lowest cost provider. In fact, you know, I don't want to be the lowest cost. I don't think I would, I wouldn't want to brag about that. I want to provide the best value, not the lowest price. And those are completely different topics. Exactly. Right. So go ahead and say, what's your definition of value and address this for our audience, the people who don't know? Well, value has nothing to do with price. I mean, they don't teach you this in college. I have a college, a good college degree. It's an accounting degree. They just, there is no, you know, there's no curriculum on price versus value. And so why does the guy go buy, uh, you know, why does he buy a flawless diamond? Because he wants value. And, and then, then there's this other person. I mean, there's markets for both that buys the cheap, ugly little diamond just to get engaged. And maybe that's because that's where he can afford or what he can afford. But in the middle between those two, most people, most of America, particularly when things get scary, people are not actually looking for the lowest price. They're looking for the most value. For instance, five years ago, people had so much free credit. Money was so cheap, and anybody could get approved that it was not uncommon for somebody to buy a car, furnish their house, and buy a condo in Miami all in the same weekend. Today, today, that's not going to happen. The consumer of today is like, okay, I either want to buy a car, or I'm going to furnish my house, or we're going to go buy a condo in Miami. But we can't do all three because we don't have the down payment, and we can't get approved for the loan. So their decision will no longer be about cars. It's going to be car versus furniture versus maybe a condo. You see, so there's going to be a tremendous uh, uh, more shopping and more competition. The car dealer thinks that the, the customer, when he comes out to shop for the you know the car, he's looking for the lowest price. But the truth is, that guy, him and his wife are deciding: is it a car or is it a condo? Or is it just furnish the house? That's what I mean when the uncertainty pervades a space. And people only have one choice, only one purchase. People are not going to quit buying. They're going to buy, but their money's going to move toward value, and that is what they perceive as value. You know, I absolutely love what you just said and reminded me of something that one I was talking with a business owner, and he was describing that he had no competition. And I was like, really? Because going to Disney is competition. You know, I could decide not to purchase your product and take my family on an extra vacation instead. And so I think that's such valuable advice. In today's world, we have to realize that everything is competition for our business. Everything is. Like when Lehman collapsed, the first thing I did, I wrote that book that weekend. And then I, I literally took a look at two things. My competition, made a list of all my competitors, and then made a list of all my products. And I looked for where my competition would not go. I literally wrote down what will they not do, where won't they go, what products or services won't they offer. And then I started looking at those spots where those gaps, if you will, the white lines on the interstate, if you're a motorcycle, if I could ride the right white line, I can actually get through the traffic. And we built, we rebuilt our products and services and then raised our prices during a time where all my competitors were lowering their price because I knew I would get fewer customers. Clearly, clearly everybody's volumes dropped when people get that scared. So what I knew I needed was more money, not less money from fewer people. Right. All right. And most of the country just did the wrong math. They went the other way, and you see a lot of companies going out of business, and big companies. Look at uh, some of the low-cost providers. Uh, I think Circuit City's one. Best Buy, uh, sure. Look at J.C. Penney and Sears that are just getting their brains you know, handed to them every day. That's right. Yep. So then can you encapsulate for us how to sell in a down market then? 
what it, it can't be simply increased price. We need to be a little bit more precise than that. Yeah. Yeah, no, no. I, I, clearly, look. The first thing that should happen is is a company needs to make a decision that you're not going to be a victim of this economy. You know, because it, we got more bad news to come. So what happens when more bad news comes? You know, and it's bigger than this today, Cyprus, and tomorrow it's oh, the United States has got a problem, or California's busted. So the first thing to decide is, look, I am not going to be a victim of the economy. I am going to create my own economy, and we're going to win as a company no matter what happens. And so if you could literally grab that mindset, we are going to win, period. The second thing to do then is to make everybody in your company assist in or directly bring in revenue for the company. The the main priority of a business is to bring in revenue. And at the top half of your income statement is about revenue. It's not about expenses. But when I go into companies, I see them spending probably 75% of their time on the bottom half of the income statement and only a small percentage of the time, typically in meetings, you know, strategizing, but not enough time in how do we how do we bring more money in here? So I want to turn take every position in the company from technology to shipping to the receptionist. And I want to make those people responsible for either directly bringing in revenue or assisting in the generation of customers and clients that could, could help the company drive revenue. So it's clear that it's not just about changing your price. It's about changing your mindset as the company, particularly in executives, saying, hey, we are a revenue company. Our survival is based in revenue. We're going to survive no matter what. Let's bring good products to the marketplace. Let's push those products into the marketplace aggressively so we can drive more revenue and worry less about our expenses and more about that top line. You wrote this book in a weekend? I wrote that book on a Sunday in three hours. Did you uh, dictate it and then transcribe? No, no, I, you just I, I actually sat, down, sat to, I, <clears throat> and pounded it out, yeah. huh? I pounded it out. It just came out. It's 30 years of content. It, it was just sitting there. You know, if you've ever seen somebody really move on something quickly, like it was just the right amount of, you know, a right amount of situation and fear and concern, and it came out, and then four months later, I wrote it. You know, uh, over the next four years, I've written uh, now a total of five books. Right. I'm working on a sixth one. Uh, I enjoyed 10x. Tell us about that. The 10x uh, rule is a book about. How to Add Wood to Your Fire. The first book was about how to sell. The second book called The Closer Survival Guide was about how to close and negotiate. The third book called If You're Not First, You're Last was a book about uh, prospecting and filling up your pipeline, having enough people to talk to. And the book that you're talking about, The 10X Rule, is my latest book. And that book is about what it takes to get known. How, How do you push through all the noise? And make yourself known, like I'm doing on this radio show today, or with Twitter, or with Facebook. When I wrote that book, the 10X Rule, I didn't have a Twitter account. Today I have a Twitter account. We've banged on it. I've personally tweeted about 31,000 times in the last 26 months. And gone from no Twitter followers to about 276,000, I think is what it is today. So, so the, the 10x rule is about how do you get known? How do you get everybody to know you? How do you market yourself, brand yourself? How do you, how do you get so much attention that people actually start hating you for it? Who hates you, Car? <laughs> no one can hate you, Grant. That's just not possible. Yeah, yeah. You need you need haters. Look, if nobody hates you, you're not doing anything. Well, I, if I, you don't have haters, you're not in the band of success. Well, I do. You know, there's that other old saying that an entrepreneur hasn't gone bankrupt once or twice isn't trying hard enough. What do you think of that? I don't. I don't like that idea. <laughs> I don't have that much courage. I don't want to go BK. Okay. Uh-huh. So, uh huh. And and the way to do that is to you know you just stay liquid and drive a lot of revenue and nobody needs to do that. So, but you do need haters. Okay. There's no company that got massive success that didn't get hated. And people, this is one of the things with America today. America is trying to please everybody rather than say, hey, this is who I am. And I'm not going away. And just because I get some criticism, I need to scream louder. 
because the the only reason anybody would criticize you is either number one, it's just kind of grates on their nerves, or number two, they're you know maybe they're intimidated by you. Maybe it's competition. It's like, what is Grant doing? Why is Grant doing that? Why is Grant on Fox? Why is Grant on CNBC? Why is Grant on doing Jim's radio show today? Because I'm trying to get attention, and, and I'm clear about it. I want attention, and I want lots of attention. And the reason I want attention and lots of attention is because money follows attention. Whoever gets the most attention ends up with the most money. And I can prove that to you in Hollywood. I can prove it to you in the NFL, in the NBA. Look at LeBron. How much attention does the king get? Well, that and is, with that attention comes money, and with that money is going to come criticism and haters. Did you read the article yesterday? I don't. I think it was in the Investors Daily about whether capitalism is moral or not. What are your thoughts on that? I wouldn't even have read the article if I saw that title. Okay. Because look, I, I need money. It's not. It's not a moral issue for me. Success is my obligation to my family. I don't come to work every day because I want to. I come so I can provide for my wife and my two kids and my own personal dreams and purpose. You know, people are acting like success is an option. If if you if it's an option for you or a possibility, you're not going to get it. And even if you do get it, somebody's going to come steal it from you. So they're going to come take it from you because you haven't made it your duty People need to understand that success is vital. It's a spiritual ingredient of a human being, regardless of what your religion is. Look, you know, successful people look more vibrant, walk different, talk different, act different, survive when things are tough differently. They give to their community more because they have more to give. They hire more people. You want to be successful. And, and if that means money, and it does today, Look, if Jesus was here today, 2,000 years later, he would have money so that he could share his name, share his beliefs. He'd probably have a G5. You know, I hope <laughs> nobody finds that offensive. Otherwise, nobody would know him. He couldn't get around enough. You need money. Your business needs money and your family needs money so that it can survive going forward into the future. Well, I 100% agree. It's uh Fun to hear someone else defend it. I'm going to write down some of those and use them myself. Grant, tell us. You know, know, rich people, I did this interview the other day. I said, rich people aren't greedy. They're gutless. Rich people, like Phil Phil Mickelson, you know, when he he came out and said the tax thing. And then he's like, oh, no, no, I recant. Look, Phil, have some guts, buddy. He's a good guy. He's given lots of money away to communities and charities. He's helped so many people. He needs to stand up and say, don't take any more money from me, California. Well, you live in Florida, so you picked the right state. That's for sure. Well, I just moved from Los Angeles. I was a resident of California for 22 years, and I'm one of the people that left. Fantastic. We can now finally point to someone and said, there is people leaving, and we know his name now. Uh, Look, I took three businesses. Uh, 13 employees came with me. I, I sold real estate there. I sold offices there. I mean, uh, uh, you know, I was here three months in Miami, and the governor of the state of Florida called me and said, hey, welcome to Florida. Uh, anything you can do to help us, anything I can do to help you, I'm here for you. I lived in California for 22 years, and nobody, not even a mayor, called me. Wow, that's amazing that the governor of Florida calls every single new person that moves to Florida. Well, I don't know if they call every <laughs> person, but, but I don't care. He called me. Uh, Grant, tell us about what the U.S. Congress and the U.S. Army have said about you recently. Well, well, the U.S. Army loves me. See, the U.S. Army, most people don't know this, but the U.S. Army, the number one initiative of the U.S. Army is recruitment. See, they have their priorities right. It's like a company. Uh, you, 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 one of your priorities as a company should be revenue, and the next one should be recruitment. You need people, and you need clients. And so the U.S. Army knows that its future is dependent upon its ability to recruit people. So what is it? its number one priority is to sell people on coming to work with the U.S. Army. So they hired me basically to go in and work with their 
uh, young, you know, these young men and women to teach them how to recruit, to handle people's objections and stalls and reasons for not joining the army. And we turned one of their battalions into the number one um, recruiting battalion in the world after only two days of working with their group. My goodness. Some nice things about me, but but I don't even I don't know if, that, <laughs> don't know if that's a good recommendation. Well, I don't know either, but at least uh, they're saying nice things about you. So they say a lot yeah. of bad things about each other. So you're in the category that they're talking good about. So that's pretty special. Yeah, maybe I just need to get a little more successful so the Congress starts, uh, you know, investigating me for something. Yes, yes, or maybe they'll do like Detroit and put you in charge of the whole thing. Boy, that's scary, huh? Well, you know, I, I feel like we'd be a lot better off if we took uh, 536 people out of the phone book and sent them up there instead. So, Yeah, yeah, don't doubt that. When does your next book come out, Grant? Well, I'm on a timeline for two books right now. I wish you wouldn't bring that up because it's very, very difficult to write under that kind of timeline, you know? Well, it only takes you three hours. No, no. You can no, have them both the done by dinner. Fourth, you can have them both no, done no, by no, dinner. Thing. Yeah, I know, but when people start telling you, hey, we'd like you to write a book about this, you know, and I, then, then it gets a little more difficult. Yep. All right. Well, we'll look forward to them uh, and uh, have you back on the show when they are ready to promote. Hey, beautiful. I appreciate you, appreciate you taking an interest. All right. Grant Cardone, thank you so much for uh, your insight, and uh, I can't wait to, to blog about your thoughts on money and capitalism, and I'm going to compare it to uh, – What's the character, Diego? Oh, gosh, the guy in Atlas Shrugged. We want to post them word for word next to each other because they're perfect. So anyway, Grant, you are fantastic. I can't wait to read your next book. Thank you so much for being on the show. Thank you so much. Have a great day. All right, you too.